Everything we're working up towards in this series, Renew, is working towards that to June 26th day. But what about what's next? What happens after baptism? So we had communion, we had baptism. Then what's next? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And we want you to count the cost. We don't want you just to come up and get wet. We want you to understand what it means when you cross the line of faith. We want you to understand what it means to actually follow Christ. Well, I am so excited about our speaker today because I I know that he's someone who has counted the cost. And it was a great cost. And Greg Marksberry is here. He's a pastor uh, who just recently moved down here. He came from a church in northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area. And it was a church of about 2,500 people where he was the senior pastor. So you can imagine that's a stable church, solid place. But God has called him to our community because he has a heart for lost people and broken people. And so when God calls... You just answer the call if you're a follower of Christ. And so Greg has moved with his family down to Lake Nona area. He's going to be planting a new church in Lake Nona area called Thrive Church. And this is a huge step of faith for he and his family. And I'm excited for him to come and preach to us today to share with us what it means to actually follow the next uh, section of your life after you give your life to Christ. Would you give a big, huge, huge welcome, River Run welcome, to Greg Marksberry. Thanks, Mitch. Love you. Wow, I'm so grateful to Mitch and to you at River Run for giving me the chance to be with you in worship today and to share the Lord's word together today in this time of worship. I love the, the fellowship, what's happening here at River Run. As I drove in today, I saw the sign, said real, relevant, relational, and I've been experiencing that all morning long. I mean, if you know Mitch Todd, like, you know that dude is real, right, and relational, and you just sense that whole vibe in the church from our first prayer time this morning, how real the people are and how relational and loving this place is. It's an awesome joy to be with you. And to get to be with Rob, I'll tell you what, man, I've been watching Rob lead worship for about 30 years as well. Mitch, and I, to, to get to be here on this day when Rob's here, I mean, what, these guys are awesome, aren't they? What a great time of worship to be engaged with. So like, like Mitch was saying, like you come up, uh, all those people baptized, they walk out of the water, on, back onto the beach, and what's next? What's life look like after we've given our hearts to Jesus? So we get to that point, we're ready to say, I, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. What's next? When Mitch gave me the title for today's message, Reclaimed, it really hit me. You know, the first thing I thought was, that, that's a big deal today, man. People reclaim all kinds of stuff today. Have you noticed that? Like reclaiming furniture is a big deal today. I was having a cup of coffee at a coffee shop and looked at the little sleeve they put on the uh, coffee cup. And I noticed it said, reclaim from recycled waste. I kind of wish I hadn't seen that, actually, <laughs> as I was watching, drinking the coffee. But reclaiming uh, is a big deal today. Do you have any reclaimed furniture in your house? Anybody reclaimed an old table or something in your house? I, I come from Kentucky. Man, in Kentucky, we reclaim about everything. Right, Mitch? I mean, they, there's nothing you let go to waste. When you go, have you seen those big tires, like an old tire that they kind of paint white and put out in the yard for a flower bed? you seen those? I think that started in Kentucky, man. You know, I really do. Now, when it comes to, to reclaiming things, uh, this, this really takes the cake right here. I mean, check this out. So somebody saw this, uh, th- these, to- I mean, why waste a good toilet when you can have a flower bed, right? I mean, that's reclaiming. Now let's take it up. Here's a touch of class, this next one. This is a touch of class in the bathroom. It's, it's the toilet shelf, right? And uh, just classing it up a bit. And, but I got to tell you, man, this one is the greatest work of art of all. Check out this toilet go-kart, you know? <laughs> It's got the coolers on there, the toilet lid steering wheel. I don't know what the toilet paper is here. Maybe the stream as you're heading down, styling through the neighborhood. But uh, it, re- reclaiming is a big deal today in our culture, in our society. And so as I thought about that, I thought, you know, what's the big idea about reclaiming furniture, whether it's old furniture or old tires or old toilets or whatever it is? What's the purpose of reclaiming? Well, it, you reclaim it to repurpose it, right? 
When, when something's reclaimed like that, it's repurposed. It's given a, a new life, a, a new meaning. It's given a new purpose. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. When you come to Jesus Christ, receive him as your Lord and Savior. When you walk out of those waters of baptism, you're walking into a life that's filled with brand new purpose, brand new meaning. It's a new life. See, reclaimed means repurposed in your life. Now, when Jesus repurposes us, it's not, to, it's not really a new purpose. He kind of, it, it, it's the original purpose for which you and I were created. When we've been repurposed through Jesus Christ, he, he restores us to the purpose God created humanity to begin with. What is that purpose? I love the way John Piper puts it. He says, we weren't created to be somebody. We were created to know somebody. We were made to know God and be known by God. He created you so that he could love you and so that you could love him. See, our original purpose from the very beginning is to pursue God, to seek a real relationship with the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, the, our Father, who loves you like a daughter, who loves you like a son. That's why we're here. That's the big purpose every single human being has on the planet, to know God. And, the problem is, it's so easy to get off purpose in life, isn't it? This is what happens to most of us. And rather than just seeking to know that somebody, the God who loves us and made us, we, we get caught up in wanting to be somebody. Start trying to keep up with the Joneses, start making it all about our kingdom, our thing, making more money, you know, more relationships, maybe just one more flame and I'm going to feel better about myself. Whatever it is, you know, we... We start chasing the things of this world and we go after the things that never really satisfy. We give ourselves to the temporary and the fruitless and the meaningless. And it never fills, it never lasts, it never satisfies. And, and we fail to pursue the, the eternal, you know, the stuff that life is really all about, God, in our lives. You know, just get off purpose. I, I'll tell you, the classic example of this in the Bible, I think, is a guy named King Solomon. Do you remember King Solomon? Solomon was king of Israel. He was the wisest man in all the earth, the Bible says. God gave him great wisdom. He was also wealthy. He's a wealthy king, one of the wealthiest men in the world of that day. He's also a sexy guy. Man, the guy had 700 wives. I just read Song of Solomon, a book he wrote. Like, so, so Solomon had, had all that. And Solomon also was powerful, a powerful king. He had it all from the world's eyes, right? But you know what Solomon wrote? It's all meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. That stuff does not matter. The only thing that satisfies, he says, at the end of the day, at the end of the matter, the only thing that, that satisfies is a relationship with God. That's what you were made for, friend. A relationship with God. So, so this life after baptism, after receiving Christ as Savior, this life is to make him our Lord, right? That's what life looks like after we come to Jesus, to make him our Lord. And to be reclaimed by God means we've been repurposed to follow him. That's what a life on target looks like. It's a life of following Jesus, we get this in a beautiful picture that the Bible gives us right out of the gate in the Gospel of Matthew. We read about Jesus being born, and then right away it kind of fast forwards to his adult life and ministry. Right? And so we read about Jesus beginning his ministry, and in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, it says this. Look at this. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he called two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. So here are a couple of guys, pretty good dudes, you know, Peter and Andrew. They're out there throwing the net in the water. They're fishing. They're doing what they love, man. They do it, they, they're doing what they know. 
they do what they do, right? They're, and it not only is something they love and get pleasure from, this fishing in the Sea of Galilee, but it provides a living. I mean, it's what puts food on their table. It's, it's what they do. And Jesus sees them out there throwing the net in the water. He says, hey, look, you come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people. Do you see what Jesus just did there? He repurposes Peter's life and his brother Andrew's life totally repurposes them and this is what repurposing looks like it's it's come follow me it's following Jesus that's what this repurposing looks like in our lives when we come to Christ and he renews us when we come up out of those waters of baptism and into a new life that new life means today and every day that follows we we follow Jesus just like Peter and Andrew we're going to follow him and he remakes us he repurposes us that that here's what that means you know you might be a banker, but that's not who you are. You might be a teacher. You might be you know, a, a baker down at Publix. You might be a stay-at-home mother. You know what your job is? It's raising ambassadors for Jesus. It, whatever you do, that doesn't define you. That's, that's an opportunity for you to live out the vocation, the life that God's given you to be a follower of Jesus and to use those opportunities not just to make a living but to reach out and bless other people as a follower of Jesus Christ so Jesus says come follow me and he reclaims these two gruff fishermen and calls them into being fishers of men when I think about being remade, repurposed, one of the most powerful stories to me, illustrations to me of that, is um, what happened with a new church we helped plant in Atlanta, a place in Atlanta called Buckhead. Maybe you've heard of it. Pretty cool place in the city of Atlanta. So as, as Mitch mentioned, I'm a church planter. You know, that's my heart. Planted a church in Atlanta years ago that God really blessed. And then I went to the church he mentioned, Northern Kentucky, great church. We, we kind of multiplied that church by planting a second campus, which was a lot of fun. And God got a hold of my heart and said, I'm not done with you planting yet. And he called us to this rapidly growing area of Orlando called Lake Nona. So we want you to plant a new church there. And by the way, it needs a new church, man. That place is growing like wildfire. It was 1,500 people in 2000, 58,000 people today. It's going to triple over the next 10 years. It's growing. And there's so few churches. There's only one church with with real property in that whole area, serving 58,000 people. So God said, I want you to go plant a church. And like, no, that, that's my heart. So we, you know, we, we did that. And that's who I am, really. I'm, I'm a church planter. And so when we helped plant this church in Buckhead, it really stood out to me what God did. A guy named Dan Garrett said, you know, I'm ready to plant this church. And he started praying about where the church would be located. And in Atlanta, there happened to be a club called the Gold Club. The Gold Club was renowned throughout Atlanta, really throughout the whole southeast. It's a place where a lot of the actors, a lot of the athletes, pro athletes who in town would visit. It's a gentleman's club. And it was um, the best-known gentleman's club in, in, in the city. What happened was the authorities found out it was being run by the mob and so they shut it down boarded it up dan garrett this church planner was praying through the city god led him to the gold club and said this place that was once all about sin i want to remake it i want to repurpose it i want to renew it i want to reclaim it and repurpose it for my glory and you know what Buckhead Church got started right in that place. And it's a thriving church today. It's amazing to see how God repurposed that building. But here's what really got me. A team goes in there to, to clean the place up. And it smelled like liquor. It was, it was in pretty bad shape. And, and we were in the locker room. I didn't even know they had locker rooms. It was a locker room for the girls, for the dancers. And we were in cleaning up the locker rooms. It, and a locker fell open, and I saw the inside of the locker door covered with pictures of beautiful young women with their little babies. For the first time, it hit me that 
these dancers, they're not objects, they're mothers. They're precious, precious people loved by God. And God's not just about repurposing bricks and mortar and buildings, but he's about remaking and regenerating and renewing and repurposing our lives. Wherever we come from, whatever we've been wrapped up in, whoever we are, whatever we've done, God is almighty. He is powerful enough to remake any of us, to renew us. That's who our God is, and he repurposes our lives to follow him. That's what it's all about. That's what Jesus called out to Peter and Andrew to do. He said, come, follow me. That's what this new life in Christ is is all about. It's following Jesus. Look at how Jesus goes on to say this. All throughout the the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus over and over again says, follow me, follow me, follow me, because that's the life. That's what's next after we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's a life of following Jesus. Look at what he says in Matthew 16, 24, and 25. Look at this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way Give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So what's it look like to follow Jesus? It's to live his way. No longer to live my way, you know, trying to be somebody. It's to live his way. It's It's to give up all that. And you know what happens when we give up all that and we start seeking the somebody, the God who made us? We find ourselves. We find what life is really all about. We find a fulfillment that's so deep and real, that's so eternal. When we follow Jesus into a relationship with God, because that's what we were created for. And so he calls us, all of us, to follow him, even when it gets hard, even when it feels like we're taking up our cross, that we follow him. That's what life is about. Now, you know, I I read recently that in America there are over 600,000 bypass surgeries every, every year, heart bypass surgeries. And in this life, when we come to know Jesus, you know, as Savior, we come up out of those waters of baptism, we start getting into the Word of God, we learn, we just soak it up, right? We're learning so much information, we can't get enough. And that's important. We've got to get the Word in our heads and in our hearts. It's a very important thing to do. But sometimes we get caught up in all the information, and we think that's what it's about, just knowing more stuff about God. Right? And so I read this, 600,000 people a year have bypass surgeries, and you know what? The doctors tell every single one of them the same thing. If you want to stay healthy, if you don't want to be back in the hospital with more surgery or dead, then this is what you need to do. You need to cut back on the alcohol. You need to stop smoking. You need to get exercise regularly, and you need to, you need to eat right, eat healthy. But here's the, the disturbing thing. 90% of those people never change their lifestyle. They know the information but they don't do it. See, when we follow Jesus, friends, this is what it's about. We follow Jesus, we've got to know it so we know what to do, but it doesn't stop with knowing it. We've got to do it. We've got to live it out, right? We've got to put into practice what we're learning. All this knowledge in our head that we learn as we become a follower of Jesus has got to filter down into our heart and from our hearts to our hands and to our feet. We don't just do it because it's made, we don't just change our behavior like for some behavior modification reason, but we are transformed by the power of God at work within us and we do these things with the heart of God and we do what Jesus did. We live a life according to his ways. We follow him. That's what he calls us to. You know, the emptiest life of all is a life that's full of self. You know it? But the fullest life of all is when we empty ourselves and we start following God. And friends, that's the life of Jesus. He emptied himself. He gave himself up on the cross because he loved you and me, did it to save us. That's his way to love people so much that we pull out the stops, we do whatever it takes to make a difference for them in his name and for their good. 
That's what the church looks like. That's the life of following Jesus. Here's how Jesus put it, right? So if we, let's just kind of wrap up with one more scripture here, here. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, there, Jesus said this, his last command, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then what? Teaching them to obey all, everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So when it, when, we, when it comes to following Jesus, the first thing that means is that we obey everything he's taught us. We learn his teachings, we learn of his ways, and we follow those ways. We obey him. That's what it looks like. That's what it means to follow him. See, Christian is, the word Christian in our society today has become like an adjective. But in the Bible, the word Christian's a noun, right? Describe somebody. And I don't know about you, but in, 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 in grade school, I learned that nouns need verbs. And Christians need verbs too. We're not just a Christian in name, but we're identified by how we live. And the way we live is we walk in the ways of Jesus. We live out his heart, his passion. We love what he loves, and we hate what he hates. And by the way, Jesus loves people. He loves the lost people. That's why he came and died for us when we were lost. And what he hates is sin. You know why? Because sin gets us off purpose. Sin literally means to miss the target. It takes us off the purpose. It distracts us causes us to live for self rather than God, and we miss out on what we were made for. And so Jesus loves people, but he hates the sin that destroys people. And so as we follow God, we begin to learn what he teaches. We learn the ways of Jesus, and we live these ways out. See, really, the life with Christ is, is, is about taking, the people, taking people to heaven with us. It's, certainly, that's the mission, to take people to heaven with us. But it's also about bringing heaven to earth, you know, by the way we live out the heart of God. It's to bring God to the people where we are, the hurting people right now. In Orlando that lost loved ones, that saw friends die this morning. It's taking the love of God in whatever way we can to people around us right now. That's what it looks like. So following Jesus means we, we do whatever he says. When God says go, you go, right? And then Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we not only do whatever he says, we go wherever he leads. We go wherever he leads. Listen, friend, he may lead you into some pretty scary places, but if you follow him, what you're going to find is he leads you to your fullest destiny every time. So Mitch talked about how we kind of, kind of moved to Lake Nona. And I'll tell you, you know, it was, it, to our friends and my, my friends in ministry, they're like, man, you are crazy. What are you thinking? I mean, you've already planted one church. Why would you want to plant another one? Why would you leave such a great church to start from scratch? That's crazy. But I'm like, hey, when God says go, you better go. You know, you follow where he leads. Now, I've got to be honest with you. There are a lot of mornings my wife Ellie and I get up, we have coffee, and we're like, what are we doing? What are we thinking? Because the work of church planting is hard work. Like, it's, it's scary. It's like, is anybody going to show up? Like, it's not easy. But what's been amazing for us in this process over the last five months since we moved here is every single week God does something amazing to remind us this is not our thing, it's his thing. And he's invited us into what he's already doing. And when you follow what God, wherever God leads you, let me tell you, he's not going to lead you into a vacuum, friend. Whatever that looks like in your life, he's going to lead you into something he's already doing. He's going to say, look, I've already got this. You follow me and watch what I'm going to do through you to make a difference right where you are in the lives of people. And so, like, the first way he showed us this, it was first week of January, Lake Nona has a, a YMCA, which is sort of the center of community life, and if you're planting a church, man, what you do is you dive into community life. I mean, you're like, we got to know people. we got to get to know people. we got to build relationships if we're going to plant a church. And so I thought, let's go to the YMCA. I'd love to coach. I've got a nine-year-old little girl. I'd love to coach her basketball team, and let's just go see if, if there's an opportunity. So we walk in, and, and we sign up to be members of the Y, and the lady at the desk says, I'm sorry, sir, but there are no more openings for the basketball teams. We start this week. 
And she said, I think it's all closed up. I said, well, would you mind checking? So she called the sports director. He said, well, no more spots for kids. He goes, well, wait a minute. We do have a spot for a second, third grade boy or girl, for the boy or girl's second, third grade team. I'm like, my daughter's in third grade. That's perfect. And then he goes, he tells the lady on the phone, he goes, but we need a coach for this team. We don't have a coach yet. And she's like, you said you'd coach, right? I'm like, yes, definitely I'd coach. And so this was a Tuesday. On Friday, we had our first practice. And I walked away thinking, wow, this is just how God works. He opened this door to us in this miraculous way to, to show us I've been, providing, I've been preparing this all along. I've got this. You can trust me. And he, and he opened the door for us to get involved and to meet people and to pour into kids' lives. Now, what was even more amazing to us is that first practice, little kid on my team named Trevor, I could tell he was lagging behind all the other kids. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew there was an issue. The next practice, his mom, a lovely lady from South Africa, said to me, she said, Coach, maybe you noticed that Trevor's a little slower than the other kids when he runs. She said, like, would you watch out for him? She said, the chemo he's taking right now is really affecting his body. What I found out was three years earlier, when he was just four years old, he contracted a rare stage four cancer that he had been battling for these three years, this precious little seven-year-old boy. And I just love Trevor's heart. Man, he would be so tired, he could hardly put one foot in front of the other, but he never wanted to come out of a game. <laughs> I learned what courage looked like to see that young man out on the basketball court. He loved basketball. I learned humility and generosity through that young man in whole brand new ways for me. And, and so I'm like, wow, Lord, I get it. That's what this is about. I, I don't even feel worthy to be Trevor's coach. Not only did you open the door for me to coach this team, but you had this team waiting. At first I thought they were the bad news bears, you know, all these kids on a waiting list. And, and so you had this team waiting with a little boy who's been battling cancer for three years. I feel unworthy to be his coach. Along the way, his mother asked my wife, she said, why are you guys here? And she said, well, we're here to plant a church. She, Trevor's mom said, look, when you, when you start your Bible studies, would you let me know? She said, I'd like to come. She said, not really for me. I haven't been around church for a long time, and I'm, to be honest with you, angry with God. I've seen so many children die these past three years. And I mean, I can get that, right? But she said, would you invite us? Because I want Trevor to know that he's got a home in heaven and that there's a God who loves him. Well, not long after that, Trevor, they were hoping this third round of chemo would put his cancer into remission, but what happened was it, it came back with a fury. It hit him so hard that he couldn't even be at our last, our last game where we gave out the trophies. So here's a picture. I, I went to the hospital where he was and gave him his trophy at the hospital. That's Trevor, precious little fellow. And he was so excited to get his trophy. It was just uh, about two months after this, just a few weeks ago, that Trevor lost his battle with cancer. And I've got to tell you, I've been so thankful for a mother who wanted her little boy to know there was a God who loved him, that he had a home in heaven. I'm so thankful that I had the chance to pray with that young man to get to help him know Jesus just a little. Friends, when I, it's kind of wrecked our hearts, Trevor's passing. But I've got that picture in my office because it reminds me every day, that's what I'm here for. That's why God called me here for Trevor and for thousands of other people like Trevor who need to know that God loves them that they've got a home in heaven too. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. There are all sorts of people around you, people who are crushed, people who are hurting, people who are confused. People are all caught up in trying to be somebody rather than to know the, the one who can make all the difference for their lives. And he's put you right where you are 
to help them know Jesus. See, that's what it looks like, this life after baptism. Every day it's a life of following Jesus. We do whatever he says. We go wherever he leads. And we just live out the heart of God. We can't do it on our own. Maybe you're here today. I mean, it's not through our strength. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, Greg, man, if you knew my life, man, I've fallen off that path so many times. I've tried to follow Jesus. But most days I want to just turn around and run. I've wandered so far. There's no way I could ever get back on the path. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe that's how you're feeling. So thankful for this promise God gives us. Check this passage out. It's from Philippians chapter 1. I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Here's what God's promise is to you. It doesn't matter. Maybe you've taken three steps forward and two steps back. Maybe you're falling down and you're wondering, man, is somebody ever going to pick me up? And God's promise is the good work I began on you, in you that day you gave your heart to me, I will be faithful to you to finish what I started. I will never give up on you. You can't run far enough for me to come, for not to come looking for you and to find you. That's how much he loves you. And if you'll turn back around, he's, you'll find him right there, arms open wide, ready to, to receive you, to love you to welcome you and to say, come on, let's go. Follow me. That's his heart for you. He's going to finish what he started in you because he loves you. So today, the big question is this. To be reclaimed means to be repurposed, to live a new life focused on knowing God, loving God, and following Jesus. Will you do it? Will you let God remake, remold, refashion, repurpose your life? He's reclaimed you for what he made you for. Will you follow Jesus? Let's pray. Dear God, sometimes we get so caught up in just trying to be somebody in this world. And it gets so heavy. It just leads us down a path that is meaningless at the end of the day. God, would you remind us today that we are already somebody. We, we are sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. You created us in your image. You love us more than we can possibly imagine. Would you just help us to live on purpose by getting to know you more and more, to follow Jesus, whatever he says, Help us to do wherever he leads, help us to go. God, I pray today that you would remake us and renew us and repurpose us. Help us to know you've reclaimed us for a reason and set us out on that path to make a difference for others in our lives. And if anyone's here right now that needs your Holy Spirit to remind them you're not done with them yet, I pray you would encourage them to, to come home, to follow Jesus through this life and into the life that he's prepared for all of us who love him in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.